me. I'd love to start at the beginning of my life, but as I, I'm nearly 100, I think that would take far too long. I want to start to the days before I became a Christian. My parents were not Christians. They occasionally went to church. Dad was famous because he invented, as an apprentice in the GPO, the automatic telephone. In other words, up to then, you always had to have an operator, but he won the prize for that of three pounds. And I think his best got the CBE for it. So poor old dad, but he never grumbled about it. At my early life was South London. I certainly wasn't a Christian. The local Bobby, who actually was quite a friendly guy, was also the goalkeeper of our local football team. And I used to stand by his goal, cheering if he ever let one in. And one day he pointed his finger at me and he said, Young Oak, I shall get you, because he knew I used to go scrumping. I will say this, he never did get me, and we still remain good friends. My early life was certainly not Christian. In fact, I got kicked out of Sunday school when I was a young man. The wonder was that my parents and the parents opposite us asked if we would like to go to Crusaders, and Crusaders were a Bible class on a Sunday afternoon, but also they did woodworking together, athletics together, camps. So it was a, a very lovely organization and much better than church as far as I could see. And Bob and I used to spend a lot of time together. And he and I actually won prizes on the same day at the national sports. He for the 220 yards as they were then and me for the 440 yards. So it's my only championship medal. We uh, went to camped together at Sutherland Bay in Dorset. And the commandant there was a fellow called Kenneth Anderson. And his uh, expertise was the fact that he designed the suspension bridge up across the Bristol Channel. But a lovely, godly man. And one particular day I was listening to the talk in the evening and I sensed that church going didn't do me any good at all. But if I really knew the Lord Jesus Christ and received him into my life, then that would make the whole difference. Obviously, I didn't know it all, but it was enough for me to go to the commandant and tell him I would love to become a Christian. And we talked together, we prayed together, kneel, kneeling down by a tea chest in his tent. Well, that was uh, when I was 14, and it wasn't long before I found myself leading in prayer in a Sunday school. It wasn't the one I was kicked out of, but I was so frightened, you wouldn't believe it. The sweat poured off me and all I was going to do was open in prayer. But a year later, having been caught up in our Christian endeavor at Pearly Baptist Church, wonderfully we were taught how to speak in public and the discipline of that with our pastor there was so tremendous, such that he asked if I would like to become a lay preacher, and so I did, and I was trained with the North East Surrey Congregational Lay Preachers Association. My elder sister, Cherry, was a lovely Christian, converted at physical education college, she being a PE teacher, used to come with me as a tremendous encouragement. My other sister also was converted, so here we are with non-Christian parents, but certainly making a difference in the home. Now you might say, well, what about the police service? I was just getting to the age of 18 and was called up for national service. And I went for the interview and for the medical, only to find out a week later, the green card through my front door to say that I was unfit to join the army. Now, believe it or not, I was a rugby player and an athlete as we've talked and a cricketer in the summer. So to be told you're unfit was a bit of a shock. And my parents tried to get an answer as to why, but the Ministry of Defence decided against that. So they paid for a private uh, two days in Harley Street in London, which must have cost them the earth, to have a thorough medical. And at the end of it all, after the two days, the physician there looked at me 
and said to this six foot four man, Robin, the only thing that's wrong with you is you've got big feet. And that was what happened. I, I came home, I suppose, elated to that, but not quite knowing what to do. I was already uh, out of school. I wasn't very keen on, on education, I suppose. And I didn't do any A-levels. So I became a civil servant, actually put into the prison commission. So that was the beginning of some sort of law uh, job. I didn't like it at all, sitting behind a desk. That wasn't me. And my elder sister, Cherry, praying with me for the right job, came across an advert for the Christian Herald, Metropolitan Police, men and women wanted. It was nice to be wanted by the police. And I hadn't actually thought of it up to then, but we both prayed together that if I go for the interview and I'm accepted for it, despite the fact I was medically unfit for the forces, and I would have to mention that, then this was God's door being opened. And sure enough, I went along They the, for that medical. Some of you may know this if you did national service. They give you the medical first. And if you pass that, then you have an interview. So I told them I was medically unfit for the army, but nothing at all wrong with me. And I showed them the letter from Harley Street. I passed the medical. I then had an interview. And of course, if you're, you would know this, if you're a lay preacher or you speak in front of a group, it's amazing how in an interview, the difference that that makes, you can think while you're speaking. And so I was accepted into the police force. The night before I joined up, my best man later on when I got married was a constable who'd been in the force for 11 years. He just simply prayed with me and said, Robin, nail your colors to the mast. I didn't quite know what he meant by that, but I soon found out when I went to training school. The training school in London was uh, with a dormitory, I think with 50 boys in it, or, and there were girls were taken off somewhere else. And the first night I was there, as was my custom, I knelt down to pray, but suddenly my door opened, and excuse the language, my new colleague, who I didn't know at all until that day, said, what the hell do you think you're doing? He saw me kneeling by my bed because my feet were underneath the floor, the, the, the wall of it, into his cubicle. And soon other people nailed my colours to the mast and found out that I was a Christian. It was a, a little bit of taunting, a little bit of fun made, but I, nothing it was, it was cruel at all. Anyway, I got the, did the 13 weeks, was eventually posted to St. John's Wood by Lord's Cricket Ground, and being a cricketer myself, that couldn't have been a better posting. The sad part there was that most of the other constables there were former servicemen, quite a bit older than, than the three of us who were sent there from training school. And they looked down their nose at us, but they expected us to do all the work while well, they pounded around beats where nothing happened, so it seemed. And one man there particularly, a fellow called Ray Smith, who used to look after the communications, he really did give me a dreadful time. And the nicknames that they invented for this Holy Joe were Robin Oak. I found it pretty hard going, to be frank. Can I just jump another 30 or 40 years after I had retired from the police service, I went to a reunion of those of us who'd been at St. John's Wood. And a lot of my colleagues were there, I didn't recognize most of them. Or this little tubby man who came up to me with his arms stretched out and he shook my hand and said, I'm Ray Smith, you may well remember me, Robin. I'd like to, you to know that after you had left St. John's Wood, my wife and I were both converted and we went on the mission field and we've just come home on furlough. But I want to say thank you to you for your witness in the police station. As a Christian, uh, obviously as a, as a policeman and a fairly fit policeman, I thoroughly enjoyed being on the beat. And so many things touched my heart. I must admit there were people like Paul Sloan who uh, was pointed out to me in, um, in the park that he was leering at the young people and the nurses who were with them and I was asked if I would take him out and his name 
I didn't know at the time, but as we left the park, I said, don't come back in again, please, they are rather suspicious of you. Not that he'd done anything, as far as I could see, to harm them, but I gave him my New Testament. Some weeks later, I was then in the area car as the passenger, and uh, we were going up one of the roads past London Zoo, and I said to Ron Bishop, do a U-turn immediately, I want to speak to that man there. So we're allowed to do U-turns if you're in a police car, and off we went. And I drew up alongside this guy, and I wound the window down, it was Philip Sloan. But before I said anything, he thrust his head and his arm and the New Testament in his hand. And I want to tell you two Bobbies, he didn't recognize me. I want to tell you both, I have become a Christian as a result of this. I asked for advice from some other people who I knew. And this little book is so helping to transform my life. That was an encouragement to me. On another occasion, I saw a lady crossing the road quite slowly with a lot of shopping bags. And I'm walking the beach, so I walked towards her and said, can I help you? And she said, young man, thank you so much. So I took her to the side of the road and I said to her, um, uh, this may sound impertinent, but I want to ask you a question. You look a lovely lady. Are you a Christian? Young man, she said, I don't need to have to answer that question. My nephew is the Bishop of Norwich. That, that I do not think would be opening the door of heaven. Anyway, we used to see each other quite a bit and she would still say, I'm still, still the auntie to my, my nephew. I don't want to go through everything of all my uh, different places. I worked in London for a long while, only three and a half years on the beat. I was taken into Scotland Yard, into the branch there. One thing I want to say, and please, there's no animosity about this, but when I arrived there, the inspector said, we're all ambitious here, Robin. Are you a Freemason? So I said, no, I'm not. I don't know anything about, what do you mean? Well, he said, you'll never get on in this job unless you're a Freemason, which sounded very strange to me. So at lunchtime the next day, I went up to Foyle's bookshop and said to the assistant there, have you any books on masonry? Uh, he said, just a moment, I'll go and get the manager. So the manager came down and said, why do you want a book on Freemasonry? And I told him, the, uh, the conversation I had. So he took me through to a back room and gave me two books, a handbook and so on. Came back to Scotland Yard in my office and the inspector said, the deputy commissioner wants to speak to you immediately. So I raced down there not knowing what on earth he wanted. And he said to me, I hear you've been to Foyles who've got a book on Freemasonry, why? And I told him, I said, uh, Without quoting my inspector at all, I said, I've heard about Freemasonry, I'd just like to know a little bit about it. But those books are not to be read by people who are non-Freemasons, so give me the books. Sir, I said, I haven't read them yet. When I've read them, I'll bring them back to you. No, he said, I want them now. I said, I'm not going to give them to you. Get out, he said. He shouted at me. And I have to admit, I thought that's the end of my career. But it's it, amazing. I very soon after that became a sergeant in West End Central and Soho, superb place to work, wonderful place to witness as a Christian. And when I think of people like the prostitutes and some of the thieves and the rogues and the robbers there, we know of many who turned to Christ because they weren't satisfied with the life that they were leading. But I was a mere sergeant there ultimately promoted to station sergeant in the days, that was the rank which Dixon of Doc Green had, three stripes and a crown over it, but that doesn't exist anymore. And then eventually as an inspector, and I went on the inspector's course down at Brams Hill Police College. And when I finished that, I had the incredible, incredible invitation. Well, as you've done so well on this course, Robin, you have won the scholarship to read law at University College London. What, that's remarkable because I, I had no A-levels or anything really. I wasn't really an educated man. I just loved policing. Anyway, I did the law degree and incredibly it came out with that uh, three years later. Straight into the right bay in the middle of London where of course the, the IRA had begun their campaign. During that time I was there, we had 59. Uh, live devices or bombs as you would call them. A frightening experience, 
But so often I would go with the army officers who were there to try and dispose of the bombs. I would sit there while they pulled them to bits and they'd say to me, hold this, hold that, will you turn that, with a live bomb in front of you. But the Lord somehow looked after Robin Oak there and ultimately promoted to chief inspector and then invited back to Brams Hill on the staff for counter-terrorism and start uh, the, the job of counter-terrorism alongside the army and the navy and the air force. And the time eventually when I was transferred to Greater Manchester Police, I went across to Northern Ireland. Lovely Christian men there in the police service, a difficult job at the time. I must admit, I was uh, heart pounding many, many times. I was, I was with an army lieutenant colonel in, in his helicopter and we used to do all our traveling in the helicopter. And one day we, we were in London Derry. He came into the meeting and said, Robin, if we don't get out now, we won't do the snowstorm outside. Off we went and suddenly he zoomed up in the air. It's just incredible. I said, wow, what's going on? He said, that was a pylon. Thanks for telling me. Anyway, that's another story. I lost my staff officer out of that because he was so frightened in the, in the helicopter. He said, that's it. That's my last flight. I'm never doing this again. And he was sent back to Manchester. Well, I, I did resume my days in London, but I had an invitation from the Chief Constable of Greater Manchester, who I knew through the Christian Police Association. And he was the president at the time. And he, through one of his superintendents, Albert Leach, said, would I come up for interview? We've got a new job here. We think you'll be suitable for that. So back I went, I had an interview there, quite a stringent interview, to be frank, but I had the invitation to go there, but I'd also been invited to a superintendent's promotion board in London. And the evening when I got back from Manchester, I said to the family, my two children, my three children and my wife, what's going to happen if I get offered both posts? And Judy, who I think was age 10 at the time, she said, Daddy, there's no worry. Whichever one is first, let's pray that that's the one God wants you to do. Next day, I went to work, and there was an invitation already there on the desk. Please, would I transfer to Greater Manchester Police and tell me the job I was going to do. That afternoon, I had the invitation by telephone to be promoted superintendent in London. So I had to take the first one. We'd agreed in prayer that it would be the first one to ask me. That's, that's how I ended up in Manchester. I hadn't got a Mancunian accent. I didn't know how I was going to be taught. But I want to tell you this, that as a Christian police officer and the Christian Police Association in most of the forces in Britain is a force to be reckoned with. And certainly that was the case in Manchester, led, of course, by Jim Anderton, the lovely Christian man who was the president. And incredibly, when he retired, I was asked to take on the presidency. Uh, but I found myself in Manchester. Um, it was awkward there, I tell you that. One day I got called in, having finished a day's duty where we were. Uh, in fact, I'd been in Northern Ireland and then back just for two or three days. Uh, the chief constable here, Robin, um, I'm sending you to Moss Side. Start there tomorrow morning. Colin Rankin has been shot. Now, he was the superintendent at Moss Side. I must admit that wasn't a great invitation. I hardly knew where Moss Side was. But off I went. I got people to pray, supporting me while there. And I know there were those who were wondering how on earth I'm going to cope. But when I arrived at Mossside Police Station, there was a welcoming hand. My clerk met me at the door and took me up to my office and he said, do you like sugar in your tea, sir? I said, forget the tea for the moment, we're going to move the furniture. Why? I said to him, I do not want to sit next to a bullet hole, which was just how Colin had been shot. So that was my starting day there. You may have heard that we had Mossside riots and so on. But during those riots, I was looking to meet the guy behind them. He was the leader of the Moss Side Youth Club. 
and uh, Charlie Moore was a drug dealer, a man who spent some years in prison for his violent behavior. But I couldn't find him anywhere. And I asked the lads, don't frighten him, but tell him the superintendent wants to see you. And one day I was sitting in my office and the sergeant phoned up and said, I've got Charlie Moore here, shall I kick him out? I said, don't you dare, I want to speak to him. Do you think that's wise, sir? I said, I do think it's wise, I'll come down and collect him. So I brought him up to my office, by which time my clerk had come into the office to see fair play. I suppose he thought, and the damage that we call to your police station. But secondly, I have become a Christian. And he told me how he was very friendly with the secretary of the girl at the Mossad Youth Club. She a Christian girl, uh, a lovely super girl from Trinidad and exactly where he comes from. And he said, I was so moved and obviously I couldn't ever ask her to marry me until I also was a Christian. And I said to him, well, I hope you haven't become a Christian just to marry her. No, no, he said, I don't think that would have gone down very well. It's made a complete difference to my life. We know you're a Christian. Please, will you come to the church where we go together and preach? And boy, what a church. I tell you that when you're standing at the front and preaching, and they don't let you sit in the pulpit, stand in the pulpit, you wander around on the platform. And if you say something they like, they yell out, say it again, brother, say it again. And so that was my introduction to West Indian Christians. I enjoyed my time in, in uh, Greater Manchester, I can tell you that a lot. But I'm skipping over a mighty lot. Incredibly, I was on the senior command course back at Brams Hill, where I've been on the staff, and ultimately it was promoted to chief superintendent and incredibly, only 18 months later to assistant chief constable, assistant to Jim Anderson, the very man who I held so highly in esteem. One particular day, I'd been spending some time previously with people of other races, and particularly the Sikhs and the Hindus, who were not getting on particularly well together. So I invited their leaders to come into my office and to the committee room and uh, I've got something to say and I'd like to hear what you want to do in a reply. I said to Jim Anderson, would you like to come and chair the meeting? Oh no, Robin, you've asked for it. I hope you... with a long white beard stood up and said Mr Oak before you say anything we know that you're a man of prayer will you please pray for this meeting now that is in, well what a shock um, now the, none of these people were Christians but I did pray for it and we talked together there were a lot of uh, points of finger and people disagreeing and so on but I said at the end of it look there's a lot I can see which is uh, not agreed by either party, but I could also see points of agreement. Why don't each of you go back to your areas, talk about this meeting, come back in a fortnight's time, which is what they did. When we went into that meeting, I walked in and the same Sikh said, Mr. Oak, last time I asked you to pray, and we believe that that prayer has made all the difference. I'm going to ask you to pray now, and I want you to bow your head. This is, this is a Sikh talking to me about prayer. Will you bow your head as you pray? And I hope you'll see the miracle that's happened when you open your eyes. So I prayed for the meeting. And when I opened my eyes, the Hindus and the Sikhs were now in one line in the middle of the room, hugging each other, weeping with each other. It was absolutely amazing. And it was a tremendous transformation in the atmosphere in Southeast Manchester where the Sikhs and the Hindus used to fight, but no longer were doing so, thanks to their leadership. So it was nice to be known as a Christian. I hope I've never hidden that. Christ, to me, was something 
someone so precious. My wife, of course, a Christian nurse, understood that, and we used to pray, we still do, pray together every day. I had three children, my son Stephen and Judy, my eldest daughter, my youngest daughter, all three themselves having found faith for themselves as Christians. Surprisingly, Steve, uh, he, they wanted to be a cartographer. The firm to whom he went when he left school folded up and he didn't know what to do. He phoned me and said, what about my, my job as a police officer? But that thing was, I said, well, I, I really don't know, but I will pray with you. About three weeks later, another assistant chief constable, Paul Whitehouse, walked into my office and said, I've had a long chat with your son this morning. I think you ought to know about it. And I thought Steve was in trouble. I knew he'd joined the police, was obviously, because we used to chat about it. But uh, I said, what is it you want to say? I said, well, he came in front of me, and although I knew who he was, he asked if he could join the force. I was so impressed with his interview and with the fact that he was talking about his Christian faith. And Paul Whitehouse actually is a Quaker, so he was quite unashamed of his Christian faith. And that was the day when Steve joined the police force in Manchester. Now, I was an assistant chief constable by then, and speaking here, there, and everywhere on behalf of the force. And one evening, I had a time in Moss Side to go and speak to a meeting there. Actually, it was a meeting of clergymen and others uh, from the churches. When I finished, I thought, well, I'll go back to Moss Side, where I used to be the superintendent. Well, Assistant chiefs don't walk into stations just like normally speaking, but I thought, well, they'll, they'll know who I am. So I wandered in there about half past ten at night, and suddenly everyone's gone to attention. And I said, come on, calm down. This is, a, this is just me visiting to see how you all are. And who should walk in but Steve with another constable? He was actually learning beats at the time, so he was paired up. And, of course, it just went completely silent. Normally, I would give Steve a hug when I first saw him, but I didn't think that was appropriate. He obviously didn't think it was appropriate. So we just stood looking at each other for a few seconds, and the sergeant who was with him said to him, go on, sir, tell him how you enjoy learning beats with me. And it broke the ice. I must admit, I did go over and give him a hug to the cheer of everybody there. But Steve enjoyed the police service. I kept in touch with him a lot. But soon after that, I was invited to go to a force, another police force, which was down the drain. It was 39th in the hit list of police officers. And it's all done, uh, how, when the forces are done, but the statistics they send in and the crimes that have been solved and so on and so forth. And it was the Isle of Man of all places. Now, I had actually been over there a couple of times to speak at two or three meetings, but I was invited to go down there for interview and incredibly had the question from the chairman of the police committee, Mr. Oak, are you a Freemason? Now, I knew that my predecessor there was, but that, that didn't sort of worry me in the least. And he said, thank God for that. And about a week later, I had a letter to say I had been chosen amongst the five others who were there, and would I start on April the 1st? Well, April the 1st is my wedding anniversary, and it wasn't a great day to start. the island people knew of my christian faith such that as chief marshal of dt and of the southern hundred and of the banks grand prix now i knew nothing about motorcycle until i went there but they asked if i would be the chief marshal but one of the things i did as well was to find out who the christians are around here within the motorcycling fraternity a fellow called Pat Slynn, who was a well-known mechanic particularly, another police officer, Graham Bailey, who was a racer. Why don't we have a Sunday service here on what we call Mad Sunday? That's the Sunday between the practices 
and the main raison a Monday. And a year later, after I'd been there, this actually happened. And all the time I was there as 13 years as chief constable, every mad Sunday we had a service from the grandstand with the speakers in the winners ros on the winners rostrum. But uh, a great atmosphere amongst police, uh, uh, motorcyclists, and members of the public. And I tried like mad always to get a motorcyclist to give his testimony from the winner's rostrum. But now here comes the crunch. I'm a Christian, I'm a, in the police force, and I know there were times when I knew that people were not liking the fact that I was a Christian, but I never had any really antipathy at all. But I used to keep in touch with Steve. Now, the incident comes like this. My wife, Chris, was over in Altrium in my daughter Susan's house with my, her husband and two children. She in hospital and really quite ill. I was alone at home, obviously. I phoned Chris and kept in touch. No problem there at all. One evening, I phoned Steve, I think it was on the Monday evening, and I said to him, uh, and he couldn't tell me the detail, but I said, what sort of week have you got ahead? Dad, he said, we've got a pretty awkward week, and tomorrow, Next day came and I was thinking of Steve through the day, but in the evening, I suppose it was about uh, half past eight, quarter to nine, sometime like that, a phone went and it was my friend Derek, Deputy Chief Constable, and uh, immediately, immediately he came on, I recognised his voice, I thought, what he want? Mr. Oak, I'm afraid I've got some desperately sad news for you. And I don't like doing it by telephone, but if I don't do it now, you'll hear about it on the radio. What's happened? He said, I'm ever so sorry to tell you, Steve has been murdered. And he told me very stunted conversation. He was really quite shocked by the whole thing about what had happened when they were doing a raid, they done a raid in the morning at six o'clock in the morning and then another one in the evening from what they found at the first raid. And there was a man who Steve actually with other special branch officers around the country was trying to trace because he was involved with uh, a group in London. And when that was raided, one of them escaped. They were trying to put rice in, in London's water. And this fellow, Steve recognized straight away hiding under a table in the kitchen of this house where they were doing the raid and little did Steve know he had a big knife up his arm and in the fight that ensued Steve was stabbed to death. Now I've told you what the time was and I thought by 10 o'clock this is going to be on the news and Chris is over in Altrium. what am I going to do? I always told my colleague never ever give bad news by telephone but I had to do it. And so I phoned Chris at about half past nine, and I don't know exactly what I said, but it was something like this, darling, I'm so sorry, I've got some dreadful news for you, and it's gonna hurt. Go on, she said, and I said, our Steve has been murdered. And there was silence. She wanted to know obviously what happened, and I told her what I knew. And then she said to me, typically my wife, lovely Christian lady that she is, where's Leslie? This is Steve's wife. Well, she's up at the hospital now where Steve had been taken and she's going to be taken home by police car in about an hour. She said, right, I shall be there to meet her at her home. Now, there was somebody there anyway, looking after the children, uh, Steve's children, that is, so that she was there to meet her back to the house. I thought that was wonderful. But then she, I had another daughter, I had to tell her, and I don't know how Sue was told, because she was in hospital in the ward, but what news for her? Well, you can't believe, I'm sure, uh, how 
sad we all were. It, I've been through many very treacherous things, and even with a, I was a firearms man as well, some dreadful situations, and yet I was never seriously hurt. Well, my two prayer partners came to the house because they'd seen it on the television news and came and spent the night with me, which I thought was very nice of them. They knew where Chris was. Next morning, the, my own deputy in, in, in the Isle of Man phoned me uh, pretty early in the morning because I hadn't slept anyway. And he said, sir, I don't know how to tell you this, but the media have chartered a plane. They're coming over to the Isle of Man and they want to meet you. I said, well, you can't stop the plane in the air. When it comes down, can you have arranged a coach and bring them down to Port Heron Police Station, which is not far from where I live, and arrange a press conference? And I'll go down there at 9.30. So I did. But you can imagine how I was feeling. I didn't particularly want to face the press at all. The press on the Isle of Man actually were very, very friendly, and we got on like a house on fire. But the, the national press didn't know me, and I wondered what on earth would be happening. Incredibly, when I walked into the press conference, they all stood up, which I thought was a magnanimous thing to do. And questions came from the floor asking about the, what happened in Manchester, and of course I didn't know all the detail anyway. But then a younger reporter stood up from the back and I could hear him clearly, but he shouted out and said, Mr. Oak, what do you think of the man who killed your son? Now that wasn't something I expected. I am a man of prayer. And as I stood there to answer this, I just was praying, Lord, help me with this answer. I suppose I was silent for... 10 to 15 seconds, I don't know, and you could sense people with bated breath waiting for my answer. And I looked at this young man and said, I don't know all the circumstances, and I certainly don't know the man, but I forgive him, and I pray that God will forgive him. And from a very docile and friendly press conference, suddenly it went berserk. They could not believe that a chief officer of police could forgive a terrorist. But I wasn't going to change that at all. I never, never ever did, and I haven't done from now. At the end of it all, the people wanted to get this story raced back to their papers. I suppose they did it by telephone. And of course, next day it was on the news and it was quite a hullabaloo. We actually had, we counted it, 565 letters, most of which were about forgiving a terrorist as a, as a police officer. But I thank God that he gave me the strength to say that, so that when I went across to Manchester or to Altrium, we of course had to work the funeral, deal with the funeral, I knew that it was, it was top news, and some days later when the Manchester Cathedral was going to take this funeral, uh, the Halley Orchestra, many of whom go to Point and Baptist Church, which is where Steve and Leslie, his wife, were attending, they provided the music. But Leslie, my daughter-in-law, said, uh, Robin, will you please welcome everybody? Now, the place was packed. Steve, you don't know this, but Steve was the first police officer in Britain to be killed by an Al-Qaeda terrorist. And it's only happened to one other person, and that's my colleague down in the House of Parliament two years ago. So only two. It was news. But anyway, I remember standing there, I had prepared something fairly short, but I said in the midst of this, today is not goodbye, Steve. It's au revoir, see you later. Now I know that one of these days, because I look forward to being in heaven, I'm going to meet Steve again. It's going to be a great hugging occasion. But boy, did that create a stir. Again, this was my, to my colleagues, they couldn't believe I would say something like that. And most of these 565 letters came, queried how I could dare say that, that I'm going to see him again. But that's part of my Christian faith. I know it to be true. And whilst I don't look forward to dying itself, I know that when I do, and when we who love the Lord Jesus do, we shall meet again. 
so really that's that's where I got to. My parents became Christians long before I got into the uh, into Manchester and they used to come to the Isle of Man and so on before they died and Chris's parents likewise. But I want to tell you all, although the job I was in was a very happy job, I enjoyed it a lot, there were many, many challenges. I was very fortunate to have been hoisted from the beat into the Scotland Yard right at the start and without being a Freemason, and please I'm not here to criti criticise Freemasonry, all I'm saying is I didn't think it fitted in with my Christianity. So it didn't make the difference anyway as far as promotion was concerned, and that wasn't my ultimate aim anyway. I want to just tell you, through my life and through my wife's life, and we pray together every single day, that we are concerned for our family wonderfully steve was converted as a young man and judy and sue and their families and as i close i just want to put this into the perspective of a christian man before he died when we heard about this of course i was over then by in Altrium. the special branch office in manchester is at manchester airport and so we went across there. We had heard there was going to be a formal service there for police colleagues and anybody could attend, people in the airport. When we got there, we went into the office and we wanted to talk with people, but a lot of them were hiding away. And two policemen particularly, we, I think Chris would have loved to have spoken to, but they hid behind some books, didn't want to meet and talk with us. I suppose they were slightly embarrassed. But anyway, when we came out of the office into the service, which this padre had started, he said, all I'm going to do is announce a hymn, we'll sing it, and then I've said, it's over to you. I would like Steve's boss to come and speak, and anybody else wants to speak, please do. So as it, we sang a hymn, and Steve's boss, Detective Inspector, came to the rostrum. He read a scripture, and then he looked up, and said, I want to be the first to speak today. Steve came into special branch and I had no idea, although I used to laugh a bit about being a Christian policeman, but he, without having to preach at all, was different, different for the best reasons, who loved the Lord Jesus. And he personally introduced me to my faith in Christ. Now this is his boss. And with that, Others in the audience standing there, colleagues of Steve, and also people from the airport, the pilots and air hostesses and people in the shops and the people on reception were all in there. They heard these testimonies of Steve's life as a, as a Christian police officer. And I just finished with this one young lad came in. He'd been converted before he came and he was shy about his faith but saw Steve and the way in which he acted, and he certainly didn't preach, but there was always something different. Steve was different. He went to Steve and said, will you pray for me? I just want to be like you. So thank you for hearing me today. I've had to rush through quite a bit, but it, to me, it's a wonderful privilege always to share something of my Christian faith, something of the gospel, and also to share with those who don't know the Lord Jesus, that they too might turn to him. Thank you, Ron.